Galatians chapter number 3. Going to begin reading verse number 24. The Bible says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now, here the Apostle Paul writes about two different dispensations in the Bible. What's dispensation mean, Brother Jordan? That big fancy term that just means that there was a space of time where what man had to do to find favor in God's eyes was different. Okay, we can go all the way back to the first dispensation, which was Adam and Eve in the garden. What they have to do? They could do anything except touch the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In that dispensation, they were made perfect, and all they had to do was stay perfect, right? Not disobey God, not to sin. Okay, then we can go look at the tribulation period. We know that during the tribulation period, under that dispensation, that anyone who's ever heard the gospel before the tribulation started, they will have their consciences seared, they'll believe a lie, they'll take the mark of the beast, and they'll be damned. We know that you have to have never heard the gospel prior to the tribulation in order to be saved out of the tribulation. Okay? But where are we at now? We're in the dispensation of grace. What came before the dispensation of grace? The dispensation of the law. When Christ came to prove that he was Christ, what did he fulfill openly, known among everyone around him? He fulfilled the law. To prove that he was the answer to the law in order to become your propitiation for your sin, that you might be able to accept him by faith and grace, right, would cause you to be saved. Now, if you go to the book of Acts, the Acts is a trans book of Acts is a transitional book. You'll find four different ways from start to end on how someone became saved and then went on to receive the Holy Ghost. Okay, nowadays, you believe, you receive. It's instantaneous. But see, you had a time period in the book of Acts where one, the Bible had not been completed yet. Two, the apostles still had apostolic gifts, the power to heal, the power to uh, see the future like John did in the book of Revelation. Right? They still had some of those gifts. They could go around and they could prove that they were the apostles of Jesus Christ. At one point, you had to be breathed on to receive the Holy Ghost. Another one, they'd lay hands on you. Right? What was that? That was a testament to those that were bearing witness that the one who has the apostolic gifts or the one who was trained by the apostle lays hands on the next one. It was essentially a chain of custody to prove that them guys weren't liars and they really had the Holy Ghost. Okay, it was authentic. Or to authenticate them is what it was. But nowadays you get the Holy Ghost as soon as you say. We don't have time to get into that. We received a letter, okay, this week that since the pastor was not here, my mom found it and then brought it to me, which was a bad idea. They signed it a very con or a concerned Christian. They weren't too concerned about getting the answer because they didn't leave me an address to send an answer back to. But anyway, they does that thank you track again. I don't know how people can get so angry at being so thank you. Right? But... We don't have time to get on all that. That's what I want to teach on today, but we're not going to teach on what Brother Jordan wants to teach on. We're going to teach on what God wants Brother Jordan to teach on today. i got enough common sense to know that. Huh? But, under the dispensation of the law, the law was our schoolmaster, the Apostle Paul writes. What is a schoolmaster's job? Well, even, to, well, can't say that. Nowadays, they're trying to teach you what a man, a woman, not a woman, what not a man, and everything in between is, Right? Now, that ain't a, what a schoolmaster's job really is. A schoolmaster's job, especially under Bible times, and when I was in school at least, okay, was to teach you what is right, what is true, things that are valuable to you, but also 
If you know what's right, you know what's wrong. Okay, I was taught that 2 plus 2 equals 4. I know that if 2 plus 2 equals 4, that means it don't equal 5. Right? If it can only equal 4, that means that 4 is the only thing that 2 plus 2 can be. Now, there's a whole bunch of other ways to get to 4. You can have 1 plus 3 and 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. But I know 2 plus 2 equals 4. Doesn't equal 5. Well, the law was our schoolmaster to show this is holy, this is not holy. The law was to show you what God accepted because God is holy. God only accepts holiness. Both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, what do you find that God instructs? Be ye holy, for I am holy. What's God's acceptable standard? Righteousness. The law was to prove to you that you were not perfect. But the law also served to show you, even though you are not perfect, God made a provision, a way, that you could have your sins pushed back. Not taken away, not atoned for, not bar, you know, wiped away, but you would find a space of grace because of Old Testament sacrifice, which he instituted at the Passover feast. Right, well... The law being our schoolmaster told us what was wrong, but it also told us what was right. Okay. Verse number 24. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. The law is still as true today as it was in the Old Testament. But if you want to live under the law, be my guest. I mean, we don't have time to get into all of chapter number 3 but verse number 1 O foolish Galatians who hath bewitched you that you should obey the truth or not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you he says how in the world did you start off on the wrong foot and then get all twist turned flipped around to where now you're following after something that is false bewitched they were tricked they were deceived they did not receive truth. Well, what was truth? The truth was that the law was to point you and to elevate your eyes to where your hope and help really came from. You could try all you want to. In fact, that rich young ruler that came to Jesus said that he had kept all the Ten Commandments his entire life. If, even if he had, which I don't believe him, but even if he had, the Ten Commandments weren't the standard. It was all some 600 laws in the Old Testament that you had to keep day in, day out, every second of every day in order to be considered righteous in the eyes of God. No man has ever done that except the man Christ Jesus. The law was to prove to you, okay, every now and then, but Jordan gets a little hard-headed. I inherit that from my mother, and then I get a little stubborn, which I get from my dad. I got the worst of both worlds. Okay, and I got my dad's temper, and my mom's cold shoulder. So if I'm angry at you, you know it. <laughs> there ain't no hiding it. But every now and then, Brother Jordan being so hard-headed as I can be, God doesn't have to show me what is right. God has to prove to me that I am wrong. There's two different things. You may know that what is right and what is wrong but God has to prove to you that you're in the wrong don't do you any good to know left from right if you don't turn right when somebody says right or when the GPS says turn left you keep going straight but oh well, I missed that turn I know how to get there anyway and then 25 minutes later you're still lost and you don't want to admit that you're wrong now, now it's going to come back around eventually if we just keep turning that direction we'll get there sooner or later and the GPS is saying pull a U-turn that's the quickest way to get out of this, but you don't want to. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? The law was to point us in a direction. The law was not to defeat you. Right? No man can fulfill the law, but God gave the law not to condemn man. Right? John 3, 17. God didn't send Christ into the world to condemn the world. No, God loved you with an everlasting love. God loved you on purpose. He so loved you that before he made the law, he made a way for you to be redeemed with Christ being the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. 
the law was not to send you to hell. Sin did that. The law was to prove to you that you were sinful. Why? So that your gaze gets a little bit higher than yourself and you're not trusting in what you see in the mirror. You turn to the one that is holy and is righteous and you lean not on your own understanding, but you acknowledge him in all your ways. What did the Lord promise that he would do? He would direct your paths. Well, the law directs everyone to one path. What's that? That's the way, the truth, and the life. It's that way called straight. It's the gate that's narrow, that leads unto life. Doesn't matter where you pick up in the law, if you follow it to its conclusion, guess who you're going to find? Christ. The law is a road map that shows you, doesn't matter how you try, doesn't matter where you go, doesn't matter how much you learn, doesn't matter how much you in the flesh work for what it is that you're trying to accomplish, there's only one way to find favor with God, and that's His darling Son. The law is your schoolmaster to teach you what? Not I, but Christ. Amen. The law is your schoolmaster to teach you what? That without Him, we can do nothing. But with Him, all things are possible. But you say, well, what kind of things are possible? Well, the thing that you being a sin-cursed, predestined to go to hell because you were conceived in sin, born in sin, and you were a sinner by practice and a sinner by trade, if nothing else happened, the only place for you was hell. But yet, because God loved you. Something very special happened. It's called the gospel. Amen. Where Christ came and did what? He fulfilled the law to prove that he was everything that you needed. But the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. That we may be justified by faith. Especially at this time, we know about the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. They all had arguments among themselves, so if they couldn't agree on something, how in the world did they think they could tell everybody else what to do about something? But anyway. They were all of the opinion that you had to work or earn God's favor. That by your attempts to keep the law, you could gain something from God. Oh, no, no. Doesn't matter how many sacrifices you make. Doesn't matter how many prayers you say. Doesn't matter how many tracts you give out. None of that brings you any closer or further away than, or from heaven. Our salvation is not based upon works, and it's not based upon how well you know the law. It's not based upon how well you perform the law. Our salvation is given by faith through Christ. We know that. But it goes on to say, but after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. The purpose of the law, according to our last verse, was to teach you right and wrong to bring you unto Christ so that you might be saved by faith. In vernacular terms, or secular terms, a teacher's job is to teach you, then to test you, to prove that you learned it, and then once you've been taught and you've passed all those tests enough, what happens? You get a certification called a diploma. You get a degree. You get a certification. There is an outward recognition that you have met the requirements to meet whatever standard it is that you're going for, whether that's a doctorate or whether it's a GED. All of it comes through what? Learning and then certification. There's a, they say he accomplished it. Here's the proof of it. They keep a record of it for years to come. You go to a job interview and you say, well, I graduated from here on such and such a date with this kind of degree. What do they do? They call up and they bear witness to the fact that, yep, he was here and we gave him the piece of paper that said he did everything that was required. Well, after you get that piece of paper, teacher don't have any authority over you anymore. They still may know more than you, but you know, they've taught you what you need to know. That's what that piece of paper says. I've learned everything that I needed. Okay? What well, says, but after the, that faith has come. What's that? The faith on Jesus Christ. We are no longer under a schoolmaster. The law only serves to condemn, to prove to you that you are not holy. If you try to live by the law as a saved, born-again Christian, you are, of all men, most miserable. 
Because every day you're going to find defeat and failure. You cannot live up to the law in and of yourself. Under the arm of flesh, you're never going to be able to accomplish what is, according to the law, a holy life before God. No one ever has outside of Christ. But it says, after faith has come. What's faith? Faith's your diploma. Faith comes in, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And what happens is, the law says, we, we proved to him that he was a sinner. Then the Holy Ghost comes in and says, and I convicted him that he didn't need the law, he needed Christ. Then he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and what? He became saved. When you get saved, there is a diploma that's stamped on your soul. The Bible says that you sealed until the day. There is a seal, a symbol etched into your soul that said he got the point. He learned from the schoolmaster that he couldn't be saved in and of himself. And because he heard the gospel, the Holy Ghost convicted him, which is another word for convinced. Uh, Y'all hear me say that all the time. Conviction, not a bad thing unless you're trying to fight it. God's just trying to prove something to you that is true. But what did he prove to you that was true before you got saved? That you was a sinner, that Jesus could save you, and that you needed him. That's all it takes to be saved. You got to know you got a need. You got to know that Christ promised to meet that need. And then you got to put your faith in that he would do what he said he would do. Not all that complicated. The schoolmaster's job is not complicated. You know what makes it complicated? Students. Teaching's not the problem. It's getting the learning done. Breaking through the will of a stubborn child. Right? Reassuring one that has doubts that what they know is true, that they can trust themselves. Right? Teaching's not the problem. It's easy for me to get up here and spout a whole bunch of stuff. But it's trying to be sensitive to the Holy Ghost and let Him use me so that I say what He wants you to hear. It's the yielding part that's hard. It's the saying, all right, I may not want to be here because I never wanted to be at school. I take that back. There were a few classes that were fun. But most of the time, I did not want to be there. You know why I didn't want to be there? Because every day they were telling me the same thing almost over and over again. I get it. I did the homework yesterday to prove to you that I got it. Why are we talking about it again? Right? Or if I get it, I should be rewarded with the fact that I don't have to be tortured by learning it again. I hate busy work. If I learned it, let's, get it, let's move on to something else. Let's keep going. Right? Don't waterboard me with more of an explanation. I get it. 2 plus 2 equals 4. 4 plus 4 equals 8. Why are we back, back on square one? We learned that last year. So, when the law comes, you get that certificate. It says you got what you needed out of the law. It says the law taught him that he was a sinner, but by faith, he's no longer a sinner. He's a saint. That diploma stamped onto your very soul says the law got him to a point where he used that measure of faith. Well, now what happened? You're no longer under the law. The law will only defeat you. Christ did not come to defeat you, keep you in chains, keep you defeated. No, he came that you might have life and life more abundantly. He came that you might understand the fullness of what it is to receive fellowship with God. He came so that you might be exactly like him one day when the process is complete and finished. Well, verse number 26. For you are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. You know who's under the law? A subject. You know who gets to enter into love and grace? A child. You don't treat a subject the same way that you do family. You don't treat a lowling like the off-scour of the world. You don't treat them like you would family. 
Didn't Jesus say to the Gentile woman that he came not to cast what was good to the dogs? That it wasn't meat to take what was the children's and cast it to the offscour of the world? She said, true, Lord. But even dogs get crumbs from the master's table. He said he hadn't seen faith like that in all Israel. Why? Because she may not have known all of the law like the Pharisees did, but she knew enough. She knew that she needed him in order to make her what God expected. Well, it says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Jew, Gentile, right? Roman, Asian, at this point in time. Didn't matter if he was from Phoenicia. Didn't matter if he was from Philippi. Didn't matter if he was taught by Paul or Peter or John or any of the other ones. All that mattered was is that he was in the family. The law took all of those that were outside and pointed them to the one person that could make them all the same on the inside. Now see, it's very easy for us to differentiate and to compartmentalize and separate people. Okay, we could go across the room today, we could separate people by height. Miss Brittany would be in the shortest group, especially if you took your shoes off. But, right? We could separate people by hair, Brother Ray be in trouble. Okay? We could separate people by color of their eyes. We could separate people by, you know, what year they was born in. We could separate people by what part of town they live in. There's a whole bunch of different ways that man, it is natural to your flesh to put barriers up and to separate things in your mind. Right? We like organization. Well, some of us like organization. Okay? Other people are anal retentive. Okay? And they got to have everything in the exact same spot. It's not how I roll. If I put something somewhere, I know where it's at. Doesn't matter if you know where it's at. I know where it's at. It's mine. It's not your problem. Don't worry about it. If you move it, I won't know where it's at no more, and then I'm going to be angry when I go back and say, who moved it? Because I know I put it there. At, at my desk, I got 900 post-it notes, but I know where each one of them is. If the cleaning people came along and just like, you know, hey, we're going to move these post-it notes so we can clean something, it'd throw everything off the next day. I may not notice it at first, but when somebody calls and says, hey, I'm calling back about that, oh yeah, I know that, and then I go to reach, it's not there no more. That's what your flesh likes to do. It likes to put things where it can wrap its head around. Right? This needs to go here. This needs to go there. The world is all about divisions. It's what critical race theory is. It's to try and divide everybody up into a group and then pit them groups against each other. I don't find that one is godly, but two, you ain't going to find chapter and verse on it. You know who we're supposed to separate from spiritually? The world. You know who we're supposed to put up, you know, boundaries against? Those that would come in and sow discord among the brethren, those that would come in and wolves in sheep's clothing. But you know what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to love. We're supposed to unify. We're supposed to take anybody, regardless of wherever they came from, bring them to Christ, and if Christ gets a hold of them, guess what they're going to be? Just like you, a child of God. There is no difference in the eyes of God. The law would separate you into a whole bunch of different categories. Right? Man, woman, Gentile, Jew, okay, foreigner, or foreigner, or stranger, or someone that's familiar. Right? May separate you as a lord or as a slave. May separate you as a judge or a prisoner. But you know what God separates people as? Family. There's only children of God. There's no stepchildren in God's family. Right? There ain't no cousins at God's house. Everybody's the same thing that Christ is. What's that? A child. There is no delineation. But I've, I've heard people, and I get it. Every now and then you get curious. I'm get more guilty than anybody else in the room. I sit around, I ask God questions that may not make a hill of beans or mount to a hill of beans in all of eternity. But every now and then, just because I'm curious and God winks at my ignorance, he'll give me an answer out of the Word of God. But what is that? I'm just curious. I'm going to know, Lord. Not doubting him, not questioning him. I'm just saying, like, Lord, 
Hey, I'll give you this one. This, I ain't going to find chapter, well, you're going to find some chapter and some verse, but we read in between the lines. Now, this ain't doctrine. This is what Brother Jordan believes. Whether you choose to believe it or not, that's up to you. But in heaven, we read that the streets are pure gold, as glass, translucent. What did he say that he's going to go and make mansions out of? Didn't he say gold and silver? Well, if the gold on the street is clear, don't you just think that the gold that he's putting your house together with is also going to be clear? Now, why in the world would he do that? So that no matter where you are, you got a perfect picture view of Christ, which is in the middle of the city. Amen. Well, but then you start asking, well, Lord, who's going to have a house closer to Jesus? We all going to have a house the same distance away from Jesus. But Jordan explained that. He's no respecter of persons. We all going to be just as close to him. How do you know? Well, because he promised that eventually everybody's going to get to sit on the throne with him. We can't all do that at once. Well, who's going to go first? Don't matter. One day is 10,000 years, and 10,000 years is a day. Don't matter where you go, you're going to have a picture-perfect view of him because he's the light of the city. If the buildings, if you couldn't see through them, there's going to be dark spots in heaven. And it says that there'll be no more darkness. You're saying, Brother Jordan, how do you figure that out? I didn't. Holy Ghost told me. Why? Because I asked him. But we're all children in God's eyes. Why are we all going to be the same distance away from the Lord? Because in his eyes, you're all the same. There's no delineation. There's no first class and second class and then, you know, economy class. There's no VIP, you get to come up here and sit down. No. There's just the children of God. Well, why is that important, Brother Jordan? Because the next verse. It says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Okay, then the end of verse number 28 says, Neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. When he says that you've been baptized into Christ, he's not talking about being dunked in water. He's talking about that spiritual baptism that happened when he took your soul, dunked it in the blood that he shed on Calvary, and then when he took it back out, it was pure white, just like him. He's talking about that internal baptism. You know what that is? Getting dunked in the water? That's an outward testimony of what you say happened on the inside. That you died out to sin and to self, and you were raised in newness of life in Christ. You can't do that inwardly. He got to do that for you. You can't even approach the throne of God, let alone get to the mercy seat where the blood of Christ is forevermore so that you can apply the blood of Christ to your life. Our God's a consuming fire. Anything unholy gets close to Him. Guess what happens? It gets burned up. But that's what, when it says that we've got to take them things that we laid up and we stored in heaven and we've got to bring them to God, that's what the judgment is. You're going to be seeing those things in your hands that you labored for, and as you approach to God, those things that aren't holy, they're just going to vanish. The only thing you're going to be left with is what is pure and holy and true. Because when you get closer to God, the only thing that can last and the only thing that can survive is what's holy, what's pure, what's right. All that wood, hay, and stubble can't get close to God. Why? Because it doesn't amount to anything. It's empty. It's vanity. There's no substance to it. The only thing that can get to God is what? What's real. What's true. But it says, For as many of you have been baptized into Christ. Now see, we know that He took us and He applied the blood that He shed on Calvary to us what we so often fail to realize is that he also took, you know, we understand that through that process, he gave a part of himself and put it in us. That's called the Holy Ghost. We know that. But what we fail to realize is that he also took you and put you into himself. He made you a part of him. Does he not say that we're engraved in the palms of his hands? 
that he bore in his body the marks that prove he was the one that bore your sins? You do realize that those nail prints in his hands and his feet, that spear thrust into his side, that doesn't do Jesus any good to carry them things around anymore. That wasn't for him. No, that was for you. So that others could see and know that he was the one that was crucified and rose again so that they could testify to you that he was who he said he was. But as he sits in heaven today, at the right hand of the Father, when the devil comes up to accuse you and says, Lord, he's not worthy of your grace. He's not worthy of your mercy. He's not worthy of your compassion and your love and all the blessings that you bestowed upon him. All Jesus has to do is hold it up and show the devil, no, nah, their name's right there. Their name's right here. You want to stick your hand in my side? You thought that you killed me. That's why that guy stuck me in the side to see if blood and water came out to prove that I was dead in the flesh. He said, you put that there, but I kept it here to prove to you that you was wrong. When you come to him and you say, Lord, today I don't feel very saved, he says, it's all right. You're engraved right here. You're a part of me and I'm a part of you. God cannot deny something that is a part of him. It's why the son never said anything against the father. It's why the father will never testify against the son. And it's why the Holy Ghost will never lie to you about Christ or about God. Because God cannot deny himself. So when you are baptized into Christ, he became a part of you, but you became a part of him. And no matter what happens, heaven and earth can pass away, but his word isn't going to pass away. And you can stand on it. Why? Because it says that you're a part of God and God can't deny a part of himself. After you get saved, you're a child of God. Why? Because you are a part of the Son of God. Because he took you and added you to him. Now we, we like to talk about that he took him and made that a part of us. But we're going to be just like him one day. What's that mean? means that he took you and one day he's going to finish the project which is what make you just like him but if we're all a part of Christ is it any wonder that the verse says that we are all one in Christ we like to think or visualize that when it says be of one mind be of one accord that's talking about the local church yes but there is also a universal church it don't matter if you got saved the day that Christ rose from the grave and it don't matter if you got saved two minutes ago each of you just as much a part of God as the other nobody got a special portion where they got saved a little bit better than you or they got a little bit more of the Holy Ghost than you or you got a little bit more than what they got you all got the same measure you're all one in Christ. We're not just all a part of one person. We're also all equal. You're all one in Christ. You know what one equals? One. You know what half equals? Not one. You know what two equals? Not one. You all received the same measure. We're all equal. And get... I mean, the song says that we may feel like he loves us the best out of all of his children, but we know from Bible that he loves all his children equally. We know that Christ is the one that receives the preeminence. Why? Because by him, many children were made. He's Lord of Lord and King of Kings. But when it comes to his children, God loves you just as much as he loves Jesus. There's got to be an oldest child. Who was it? Christ. How old's everybody else? Same. In God's eyes, the Bible says that once you're robed in Christ's righteousness, once you get saved, your conversation's already recorded there. You've already got a place set for you at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Everything's waiting on you, but it's all already prepared. And once we get there, the Bible says that our sins are gone. G O N E after the blood has been applied. You know what that means? God don't know about them. It's not that he forgot them. Not that he wiped the slate clean. Not that he hid it behind his back. No, no, no. Gone. Never existed. 
You may remember them. God don't. In God's eyes, you always have been a child of God. That ever dawns on you, right? That gives some people a whole lot more victory than they currently have. In God's eyes, there's never not been a time that you haven't been a child of God. In God's minds, you never were lost. You've just always been in the family. Why? Because he made you a part of Christ and he made Christ a part of you. Christ is everlasting. What's he testify of? Father, he's going to be with us for all of eternity. All right? He one of the family. If you're in the family, you're family. Can't get rid of family. No, we can try. Good. There's some people that you marry into the family. They're not family by blood. Right? You can get rid of them. It's real easy. Mm -hmm. Get an annulment. Right, then they're not family no more. But no, blood family, you can't get rid of them. Why? Because there's something in you and there's something in them that says we related. And it don't matter how far y'all get apart. doesn't matter how far y'all go away from one another. doesn't matter how much you hate each other, love each other. If they'd take a blood sample, they'd come back and they'd say, they family. Well, because the blood's been applied to you, don't matter how much of a sample God takes, doesn't matter when he takes it, doesn't matter how hard the day is, doesn't matter how great the day was, if he takes the blood that's been applied to your life and he takes the blood from that mercy seat that Jesus shed, guess what he's coming back? Family. Doesn't matter how scraped up you get, doesn't matter how dirty you get, if you come and say, Lord, I messed up, all he does is he sees family. You know what God does to family, to his children? He takes care of them. He promised that if you're faithful to confess your sins, He promised that if we were to repent and to turn from it, that it'd be forgiven. What, for, what's forgiven mean? It means as if it never happened. True forgiveness is not saying, all right, I'm, I forgive you for whatever you did, but I'm not going to talk to you no more. That's not forgiveness. Biblical forgiveness means if I forgive you, I act as if it never happened in the first place. We go back to the way things were before. That's what forgiveness means. So when God says that he'll forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness, it's as if it never happened again. What's that? He doesn't remember the time that you fell down and you got scraped up and you made a mess of things. All he remembers is that your family. And any time that the devil comes and says, Lord, you remember this? He says, nope, his family. We took a blood test. Guess what it came back as? Christ. Y'all won in Christ. That means if he did it for one, he'll do it for any of us. We all got the same thing. You know what it is? We got Christ. And we all got into the same thing. We all got into Christ. It says there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. What's that? It's saying God got rid of all them divisions that the world wants to think about. There are no slaves in God's house. There's children. And no male, no female. There's children. Right? There's no master, there's no servant, there's the Lord, and then there's family. There's God and God's children. Amen. The, does not the Bible say that the last shall be first, first shall be last? We all won. We all God's children. Now if we is to take a snapshot, if you will, into the future at the marriage supper of the Lamb, who's getting served first at the marriage feast? The, the bridegroom. He's going to get served first. Then who gets served next? All of us. Well, how's that going to happen? Jesus, go back and listen to a couple of messages. The disciples were locked up in a building. They was boarded up like they was at the Alamo. And what happened? Jesus just showed up in the middle. Nobody opened the door. He didn't knock. He was just there. What happened? He walked through the wall. I don't even think he walked through the wall. I think he just said, all right, Father, I'm going to go down there and talk to him. And then boom, he's there. What he's saying, Brother Jordan, if he can do that, you don't think he can serve more than one person at the marriage supper at a time? What order are you getting served in? Same order as everybody else. We all getting served at once. Why? Because we're all one. There are no divisions in God's eyes. You know what there are? There's children, and then there's the children of the world. Once you get in, once the schoolmaster, once the law proves to you that you're a sinner, 
once you find out that there's a hope for sinners and you put your faith into Christ and Christ saves you, guess what you are? You and the family. No different than anybody else. Well, verse number 29, and if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed. The heirs according to the promise. You know what that means? It says you're not just in the family. I don't even make any difference between the one that I made the promise with, Abraham. The chosen people. He says, you may not have been born a Jew, but guess what you are now, chosen? You know all those promises that people like to read in the Old Testament? Technically, you don't have a claim to them in the flesh. Unless you're Jewish. But you got to be 100% Jew. Can't be half-breed, can't be any Gentile. you got to be 100% stock of Abraham's seed. And then you get all them promises from the Old Testament, except there's a, there's a problem with that. See, once you're in the family, it don't matter how you got to the family, your family. Yes, Israel is still God's chosen people, and He's going to bless them to bless them and curse them to curse them. God's still coming back for them at the Battle of Armageddon. After the end of Jacob's trial, right the time of Jacob's trouble, guess who He's coming back for? Israel. But guess who's coming back with him? Me. You Jewish? Nope. But I'm one of the chosen. He's coming back for them. Why well, I said they can be a part of us. We all the same. Doesn't matter which dispensation. Why? Because all that God cares about is that you're in the family. Doesn't matter when you got in. Doesn't matter how long you knew about it before you got in. Doesn't matter if your generations beforehand and generations before that all knew about God before you got saved or if you are the first person in your entire family to ever get saved. Right? There's no hierarchy. There's no nobleship in God. Y'all made kings and priests. We're all one. Why? Because we were baptized into Christ. Amen. Well, because you were baptized into Christ, now you can put on Christ. Amen. Being a part of them isn't enough. Having him in you and you in him, that's part of the process. But because you are a part now, God expects you to put on Christ. Shed those earthly garments. Shed that fleshly apparel. Get rid of the tattered garments that the world left you with. And put what on? Put on that robe that the Father came and fell down on the prodigal son with. What did he give me? He gave him the best robe. Gave him the rings off of his own hand. Put shoes on his feet. The father took off the world and presented those things to the prodigal son. But the son had to choose to put them on. I know that I'm robed in his righteousness, but I'm supposed to be not just in Christ, I'm supposed to have Christ on me. Got to put on Christ. Amen. Means every day I wake up and I don't put on them sandals. Right, they got spikes on them and that, you know, I'm ready to go around and kick somebody with. Now I'm supposed to have my feet shod with the preparation of peace, not war. I'm supposed to have my loins girt with righteousness. I have no righteousness in my own. The Bible tells us our righteousness is filthy rags. Where do you think I get that righteousness from? I get it from Christ. I got to choose to put it on. I got to put on that coat that says I'm an ambassador of Christ. You know what identifies you as an American? The flag. You get a passport, guess what's in that passport? Somewhere there's that flag. You get a driver's license, somewhere on that, it's going to say Kentucky, if you live in Kentucky. If you live somewhere else, it's going to say diff something different. But it associates you with where you come from. But if you've been put into Christ, and Christ has been put into you, you ought to desire to put on something that identifies you as one of His. Because you were baptized into Christ, Christ became a part of you. But you got to choose to put on the garments. You got to choose to put on speech that is becoming a child of God. You've got to choose to put on and make actions knowing that you do all things as unto Christ that God would approve of. Hallelujah, we're all one in the family, but you know what that means? We all got the same expectations. 
You've heard our pastor say it, and he's not joking when he does say it. There'd be sometimes, usually me, because my favorite word was why. And I'd be like, hey, Dad, how come we can't go do that? And he'd say, because you're a foster. Fosters don't act that way. All right, that's enough. I get the point. Fosters don't do that. They may do that, but we don't do that. And you knew when he said it, it wasn't because necessarily there's anything wrong with it, but you understood there's a better expectation maybe than somebody else. There were a few times, <laughs> there were a few times that we'd be sitting there in the mall parking lot or something, or we'd be sitting outside of Kroger, and somebody come along looking like a dragon with green hair and a whole bunch of metal poking out of the face, right? And they'd say, you know why people do that? They do that for attention. And he'd say, you don't ever have to do that for attention. All you got to do is come and say, hey, Dad, can I talk to you? And you'd have attention. He'd say, you can always come and say, hey, Mom, I need to talk to you about something. He says, and she'll show you attention. He says, fosters don't need to dress like that to get attention because your parents love you very much. He's saying, I'm not saying their parents don't love them, but he's saying, we love you enough that we're going to pay attention to you when you ask us to. What do you say? There's a standard that comes with being a child of God. And because God expects much of you, He's willing to give you much. Because He knows that you're not able to do it yourself. That's why Christ came in the first place. God gives you much so that you are equipped and able to put on Christ every day. We've already said, He said, be ye holy. Why? Because He knows that in Christ you can be holy. He doesn't command you to do something that he knows you cannot do because then he would be permanently making you a sinner for all of eternity. God's not condemning you when he says put on Christ. He's saying take those things that God made a part of you and instead of keeping them right vacuum sealed and in bags and stored away for an Armageddon sort of situation, no, take them out of the closet and proudly display them every day in life those fruits of the spirit they're not for you to hoard in your own refrigerator he gave us fruit why so that we could go and say hey the Lord gave me this taste and see that the Lord is good the fruit is the proof of what kind of tree it is or what kind of plant it is to put on Christ means to proudly display those things that he's allowed to take root in your life not to hide them but not also to rub them in everybody else's face. Ooh, I've got mercy from God today. Right? He don't want you to do that. What's he want you to do? He wants you to be who you are. As Brother Buster Kinsey said one time, bloom where you're planting. Wherever God puts you, get as big and grow as much fruit as God will have you grow. Amen. You didn't get to choose where you was planted, but guess what we're all planted in? We all got the same root and the same seed. It's called Christ. Go read the book of Revelation. He's both the root and the seed of David. What does that mean? He started it and he finished it. And in between, he's everything that you need. And he grafted you into what? Himself, the true vine, the living vine. You do realize once they do that with those, you know, it could be grapevine, could be an olive vine, could be any kind of plant. If you graft it into something, that means that what's a part of the living vine, the true one, the one that you're making it a part of, it replaces everything on the inside. The outside may still look like a twig that came from a different vine, but on the inside, the living branch, right, the, the root, cores out and replaces everything that used to be a part of the old one. You may say, well, I still look the same on the outside, but on the inside, everything's different. Well, how's the world going to know that unless you put on Christ? You say, Lord, break me open so that people can see what's on the inside. Lord, I understand that you don't want my destruction, but every now and then you've got to prune me back. And when he prunes those things out of your life, guess what they can get a glimpse of? What's on the inside. We choose to put on Christ. Why? Because we are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I am not ashamed of what Christ did for me. I am not ashamed of what Christ made me into. Why? Because he made me one with his son we put on Christ 
Because Christ put us into Him. He proudly and openly declares before His Father, they're one of mine. He's in the family. So why should we not proudly and openly declare, He's a part of me? Because He took me and made me a part of Him. I'm no one special. I'm just a beggar that found some bread and I'm telling y'all where you can get a meal. I'm no one. In fact, the Apostle Paul said, I'm chiefest of sinners. If you really start thinking about it, you're going to come to the same conclusion. You may not have done all the things that the worst people in the world have ever, everybody has ever done, but you know what you did? Your sin hung Christ on Calvary. I find myself chief among sinners because I can't point to anybody else and say, you're the reason Jesus died. If we get into it, you know why Christ died? Because of me. That makes me most guilty. You know what price it took to save me? Same price it took to save you. Amen. That's why on the other side, we're all one. We all got the same payment. We all got the same birth. We all got the same wardrobe. It's just a choice of whether or not you're going to put on outwardly what God has given you inwardly. Amen. If anybody else can do it, that means you can do it. Because we're all one. If anybody else has ever been able to be used of God, it means God can use you. It's not about whether it's the first time or the nine millionth time that you've put on the wardrobe. If you put it on, we all look the same. Because we're all one. You know what we look like? Christ. When we put on Christ, you know who gets the glory? Christ. Why? Because we're all in Christ. God put himself in you and you in him so that he could robe you as a child. If you don't put on Christ outwardly, you're not even embracing the fullness of your own salvation. You're robbing God of being able to bless you the way that he desires to because you're refusing to be an obedient child and instead you're choosing to be rebellious. When we conform to the image of His Son, that's when we truly become what it is He desired us to be. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.